You're listening to Reach MD, and this is Lipid Illumination, sponsored by the National Lipid Association. I'm your host, Dr. Alan Brown, and I'm at the National Lipid Association's annual scientific sessions in Las Vegas. And with me today is one of the top winners of the National Lipid Association Young Investigator Competition, Dr. Ravathi Balakrishnan. Ravathi is a second-year cardiology fellow in training at New York University Langone Medical Center. She completed residency training in both internal medicine and general preventative medicine at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine and obtained a master's in public health from Boston University. Welcome to the program, Ravathi. Hello. Today. Thank you for having me. So, can you tell us a little bit uh, about your background and then we'll get into your study. Uh, you're obviously interested in preventative medicine. Tell us a little bit about uh, why you chose that field and what your interests are. Sure. Um, well, you know, I first got interested in prevention during my residency training at Mount Sinai. Um, I did uh, an additional year on top of my internal medicine training in general preventive medicine. And that was an important experience for me because uh, we worked with the East Harlem population in secondary stroke prevention, uh, working on a project with uh, Dr. Carol Horowitz from the uh, Division of General Internal Medicine there. And I really saw the importance of education about diet and lifestyle and just really got you know a glimpse into how little people actually do know about prevention and how, how really important it is in terms of decreasing morbidity and, and mortality. Uh, and I feel like you know we treat a lot of disease in cardiology, um, but a lot of times the focus isn't necessarily on prevention. And you can treat the disease all you want, but I feel like if you're not addressing prevention, sort of the, the cat's out of the bag and you sort of miss, miss the boat. Well, that's terrific. As you know, at the NLA, you know, we're one of those organizations that focuses on outpatient care and preventative care. Mm -hmm. Most of all of us trained with a high emphasis on hospital care. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I applaud you for trying to help educate new people as well as yourself on how to deal with outpatients and, and provide preventative services. So with that, let's move on to your study. I personally find that study very interesting because obviously I'm concerned about diabetes in patients with cardiovascular disease. I'm going to let you start by telling us a little bit about the background of the trial, what was sure. the question you were asking, sure. and then uh, your methodology. So the, the genesis of the study is actually pretty interesting. One of the interventionalists in uh, the NYU Cardiac Catheterization Lab, Dr. Jim Slater, had noticed that there were a significant amount of patients that were coming in for repeat interventions, repeat catheterizations, and oftentimes they had a lot of the risk factors that were potentially modifiable um, that were not well controlled. Um, so in conjunction with the NYU Center for Preventive Cardiology and our specialists, they developed a preventive consultation service. And the goal of that essentially was to uh, see every patient who has a peripheral or coronary intervention within 24 hours of their intervention, um, administer a, a pretty comprehensive survey that uh, looks at medical history, medications, dietary, social habits, um, and tries to identify potentially modifiable risk factors and recommend, uh, recommend treatment and potential therapy for, for them and sort of counsel the patients at the time of their intervention to hopefully motivate them to make some changes. So I suppose that led you to your concept of your study after Correct. Observing so, certain issues with these patients. Right. So one thing that popped up uh, frequently or not, not infrequently was they were noticing, you know, that hemoglobin A1C levels were, were elevated on patients who were coming in without a diagnosis of diabetes. And as it turns out, with the result of our study, once we analyzed our database, we noticed that of the patients who were admitted without a known diagnosis of diabetes, about 10% of them met criteria for diabetes using the hemoglobin A1C cutoff of about 6.5%. So it's about one in 10 of every patient who was coming in for an intervention uh, without a history of diabetes was leaving the hospital with a diagnosis of diabetes. 
Yeah, many years ago, Steve Hafner described what he called the ticking clock phenomenon, which is that patients would have uh, the development of metabolic syndrome. Mm -hmm. They would gradually develop atherosclerosis mm -hmm. because of their low HDL, high triglycerides, hypertension, et cetera, and their insulin resistance. They would come in with their first coronary event, and then a year or two later, they'd show up with diabetes. So here you're dealing with patients right. that have known atherosclerosis and right. looking at the incidence of undiagnosed diabetes. Correct. So walk us through exactly how you designed this study, mm -hmm. and then I'd like you to tell us what you found. So the way that the study was actually designed was as a just a, actually just a prospective database of these patients who are coming in for, for catheterization. Um, and every patient was administered uh, about a 100-question survey and lab work was sent at the time of admission. And when we are analyzing the database, because people had, you know, who, were, who were seeing these patients had brought up this issue of noticing poor glycemic control in these patients, um, we decided to basically interrogate the database based on specific A1C level cutoffs um, that the American Diabetes Association had recommended in one of their position statements from 2010. So an A1C of 5.7 to 6.4 uh, is categorized as prediabetes by the ADA, and an A1C that is 6.5 or over is categorized as diabetic. Okay, so these are patients coming in for intervention that previously were undiagnosed. What did you Correct. find when you looked at the intervention patients in terms of the incidence of undiagnosed diabetes? So we found that about 10% of the patients had undiagnosed diabetes by A1C criteria. And even more alarmingly, we found that about 57% of the patients had prediabetes by the cutoff of about 5.7 to 6.4. Um, and altogether, in the entire population, that means that only 30% of the patients coming in actually had a normal glycemic status based on A1C levels. If you're just joining us, this is ReachMD, the channel for medical professionals. I'm your host, Dr. Alan Brown, speaking with Dr. Ravethi Balakrishnan at the NLA's annual scientific sessions. She is one of the top winners of the National Lipid Association's Young Investigator competition. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so very interesting results, and obviously there's lots of public health implications. Mm -hmm. For the few minutes that we have left, I'd kind of like to hear, you know, whether or not the results of this trial that showed lots of mm -hmm. undiagnosed diabetics and lots of pre-diabetics coming in for intervention. And metabolic it, syndrome as well. We looked at that as well, and we found metabolic syndrome in over half of our patients as well. So first, let's talk about whether this prompted you to do anything different now that you have a preventative consultative service, which is very impressive, by the way, and how you tied this information from your trial into your daily consult service. And then secondly, I, I want to end with some of your thoughts on how this might have public health implications. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, at, w because of all of the poor, poorly controlled risk factors that we found, not only with the glycemic status in these patients, but such things as like blood pressure control, about a third of our patients had blood pressures over 140 over 80. Only about 75% of our patients were on lipid-lowering therapy, um, and about a third of the patients had LDLs that were above 100. Uh, Dr. Eugenia Gianos, uh, who runs the Preventive uh, Cardiology Fellowship Program at NYU, has developed a prospective randomized trial called the IMPACT trial, and uh, that is going to be looking at the effects of targeted motivational interviewing on changes in potentially modifiable risk factors. So basically what happens, we're recruiting from that same pool of patients, uh, and on enrollment into the trial, they'll meet with a behavior psychologist and who will do an assessment of what risk factors these patients are willing to change, whether it be weight loss or adherence to medications, and then they'll be followed up over a six-month period with phone calls initially at uh, two-week periods and then on monthly periods for about six months. And then we're going to look at outcomes and see how well uh, the targeted motivational interviewing uh, was able to actually make changes. 
So <clears throat> were the interventionalists shocked when you showed them how many patients w had undiagnosed diabetes? And, I, and more importantly, did they leave the hospital with a diagnosis of <laughs> diabetes? Yeah, I mean, they were definitely shocked. And now, now that we have found this information, we are routinely checking hemoglobin A1Cs on our patients who are admitted and have interventions performed. And I think one of the next things that we do want to look at is what the potential cost effectiveness of this may be uh, overall, because you know the NHANES data shows us that you know the the prevalence of prediabetes in the general population is is about 35 percent. Metabolic syndrome is about 40, 45 percent as well. And in our population, we found significantly higher proportions of of both those disease states. And I don't think it's on the radar of a lot of cardiologists who are practicing right now to necessarily be aware of that and, and checking for that. And I think, you know, being aware of that is important because it's very important to catch people when they're in that window before they eventually progress to diabetes and potentially have the downstream microvascular and macrovascular complications. It's, it's in a very important window period, I think, to identify in patients to really have an opportunity to make some important changes in modifying cardiovascular risk. Well, yeah, I applaud you for that. I, I think, you know, unfortunately, from the time a patient develops type 2 diabetes until it's diagnosed can be anywhere from 10 to 14 years on average. And uh, I know the American College of Cardiology has had a big push to uh, try and encourage cardiologists to, to know how to diagnose diabetes mm -hmm. and at least make the diagnosis and then get the patients treated. But we do follow patients over and over for many years right. with coronary disease and a lot of them develop diabetes right in front of our eyes and mm -hmm. frequently that we're the first one to have the opportunity to make the diagnosis because they're seeing us for their follow-up of bypass or angioplasty. Right. I think you're so right. And of course uh, my experience in the cath lab has been the same as yours. A lot of patients arrive with diabetes mm -hmm. never previously diagnosed and you have to wonder how long did they have it. That's right. So any strategy to make the diagnosis is going to be very helpful and you know I applaud your work. Thank you. And, I, you know, the, the sort of scary thing, I think, is that I think this is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, we know that hemoglobin A1C compared to impaired fasting glucose and oral glucose tolerance testing might not be quite as sensitive in diagnosing diabetes. It's about, you know, 40 to 50 percent sensitivity compared to other more gold standard testing. So if you think about that, potentially twice the amount that we found actually might have diabetes or pre-diabetes sure. so there was a resistance for a long time to use a1c as um, anything more than a monitor of therapy right. and of course the ada right. now has come up with the number of 6.5 as definitive diabetes but as you say it doesn't rule out that a lower a1c can be seen in a That's patient correct. with diabetes so i certainly encourage uh, our audience to make sure that they're aware of how to make the diagnosis and, and I, I think that <clears throat> it's also unfortunate there's a certain resistance to tell a patient they have diabetes. The doctors That's kind correct. of feel like I'm opening a big bag of worms. I mm -hmm. don't want to give them the bad news. Let somebody else tell them. And uh, that's probably part of the reason that there's a delay in diagnosis. Do you agree with that? Oh, definitely. And there was some NHANES data that had showed that, you know, actually only 7% of people with prediabetes actually know that they have prediabetes, which is sort of alarming. Um, so I feel like it's an important thing for people to know so that they know that this is something that they need to change. Well, thank you very much for being with us today. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. This is a topic I think we could talk about for a long time. And I applaud you on your study and also congratulate you on winning the uh, National Lipid Association's Young Investigator Award. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. I'm Dr. Alan Brown, and you've been listening to Lipid Illumination, sponsored by the National Lipid Association on ReachMD. Be sure to visit our website at reachmd.com slash lipids, featuring podcasts of this and other series, and thank you all very much for listening.